Good morning, uh, dear organizers, invited guests, conference participants and panelists of this session. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today on 12th of June in Serotsk, in the Hotel Narville, on the occasion of the European, Board, European Day for Board Guards, organized by the European Border and Coast Guard Agency Frontex. And I have the honor to moderate the session number three, and its title is Border Security as Part of Internal and External Security. So, as far as we know, safety and security issues are gaining momentum in the EU in recent years, both internally and externally. This results from the dramatic events in the EU, such as the terrorist attacks carried out in different member states, including most recently those in London, and before in France, Belgium, Germany, or Sweden. What also matters is the migration and the refugee crisis that covered not only migrant receiving states in the EU, such as Germany, Hungary or France, but also non-EU transitory countries, especially Turkey, and countries of origin of migrants and refugees, for example, Syria. That is why this crisis, I mean twin migration and the refugee crisis, could be considered in a much broader context as a structural crisis of the Mediterranean region. However, while thinking about the EU's geographical neighborhood, it's important to remember not only about the unstable situation in the south of the Mediterranean region. What also matters is the situation in the east, especially in eastern part of Ukraine. So, as we can see, there are many factors that could increase the importance of safety and security issues nowadays in the EU in both dimensions, internal and external. Security-related issues are numerous, diversified, complex and multidimensional. And they need to be approached with the engagement of different actors at different levels. Due to the developments in the EU and in its neighborhood, in 2015, the European Commission proposed two comprehensive documents, European Agenda on Migration and then European Agenda on Security. In December of the same year, the European Commission adopted an important set of measures to manage the EU's external borders and protect the Schengen area without internal borders. Moreover, the work on the so-called EU Global Strategy started. And now let me briefly refer to a short quotation from one of the documents I've just mentioned uh, in this introductory remarks. This is about uh, the phrases taken from European Agenda on Security. So this document starts with the following words. The EU aims to ensure that people live in an area of freedom, security and justice without internal frontiers. Europeans need to feel confident that wherever they move, within Europe, their freedom and their security are well protected in full compliance with the Union's values, including the rule of law and fundamental rights. In recent years, new and complex threats have emerged highlighting the need for further synergies and closer cooperation at all levels. Many of today's security concerns originate from instability in the EU's immediate neighborhood and changing forms of radicalization violence, and terrorism. Threats are becoming more varied and more international, as well as increasingly cross-border and cross-sectional in nature. These threats require an effective and coordinated response at European level. So taking these words into consideration and my short introduction to our, our session, but also taking into consideration the title and the scope of this discussion panel, we invited four experts to discuss the current state of play in the field of safety and security in the EU, with a special focus on the border security related issues. Together, we want to identify main risks and threats to the internal and external security in the EU from an academic perspective, from the perspective of experience uh, of uh, officials working in Frontex, but also taking into consideration the experience of member states and border guards. And now uh, I would like to introduce our four speakers, uh, I mean panelists of the session number three. Mr. Klaus Riesler, 
He's Director of Operations Division of the European Border and Coast Guard Agency Frontex, just to remind all of you. Um, Mr. Rischler is responsible for the Comprehensive Operational Information Management and Frontex Situation Center, including the operational implementation of Eurosur Business Framework, the strategic and operational risk analysis on illegal migration and related crime at external borders of the EU, as well as the planning, implementation and evaluation of border control joint operations and other activities. Uh, now let me briefly introduce our second guest, uh, Mr. Egert Belitsev, who is a counsellor in the field of illegal migration, frontiers and Schengen matters at the permanent representation of Estonia to the EU. He started his professional career in 2006 at the Estonian Citizenship and Migration Board as a migration surveillance inspector. His main responsibilities in various positions held there and at the Estonian Police and Border Guard Board were the coordination and development of migration surveillance in Estonia. Our next speaker is Dr. Julie Norris. Uh, she is a psychologist with wide experience in the design, development and validation of law enforcement learning and training programs. She has worked inter alia for the Irish National Police Service, Frontex and Interpol, specializing in the development of operationally relevant practical courses that meet the standards of the Bologna and Copenhagen proce processes. And what is important, she was strongly involved in the design and development of the European Joint Masters in Strategic Border Management. And uh, taking this into uh, consideration, our fourth and last panelist is Pascal Robin Wolf. He has just graduated this year from the mentioned uh, Joint Master Program. And Pascal Wolf uh, is uh, a major and commanding officer of the Scheldestromen Border Control Brigade of the Royal Netherlands Marais Chaussée. After graduating from the Dutch Royal Military Academy, he started his career as a second lieutenant. He was later served as deputy commander of the operational unit at the second largest airport in the Netherlands. So now we have one hour for the core part of the debate. We are supposed to be done at 1 p.m. So firstly, I would like to ask each of uh, our panelists to shortly refer to the topic of our session from his or her perspective and experience. And after, there will be time for comments and questions, hopefully, from our active and involved audience. So what we have as the speeches. Our two first speakers, uh, these are Mr. Rischler and Mr. Belitsev. They will give us some introductory remarks about the EU security nowadays. Uh, Mr. Rischler will explain us what is Frontex role as a key actor supporting enhanced internal security. And then Mr. Belitsev will tell us how using modern IT solutions on some examples in border management could enhance security in Europe. Then Dr. Julie Norris, on the basis of her experience, will focus on the role of training in supporting Frontex, coordinated response to internal and external security. As we will see, training matters for all levels of border guard officers in achieving both effective cooperation and inter operability. And finally, uh, Pascal, Mr. Wolf, referring to the result of his research, will discuss how demanding working environment at external and internal borders, but also inside the Schengen area, could influence the border guards' mental health, especially nowadays. So as you can see, we have four speeches, uh, even a great variety of topics to be covered. We have those that are very general, and we have those that will be the case study. So now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Rissler. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Marta. And I would, I would like to start my statement making reference to what you said in your introductory remarks um, when quoting initial uh, statement or initial, initial recitals of the EU agenda for security by saying now myself that lifting the internal borders within the Schengen area requires stronger security measures at the external borders, means security as a way to safeguard internal mobility. And Europe 
needs to know wh who wants to enter. This is so simple, so valid, and so challenging. And it applies at each border crossing point where we make the security check, the border check. But it should also, and it has to apply at uh, regions and locations where member states are confronted with massive migratory flows. And, and uh, during the migration crisis 2015, this security element, this border check requirements regained relevance in exactly those regions and locations where we are confronted with massive migratory flows. And, and it led into the hotspot approach and it led in, uh, to the establishment of the European Regional Task Force where we implement the same measures or in principle the same measures at, uh, as at border crossing points when doing the screening, when trying to identify the presumed nationality of migrants. Those minority of migrants that come with documents, we can, we can make the document check and we are deploying advanced level document experts at the Greek islands and in Italy, in Sicily. But for those who are undocumented, and this is the majority, we need screening in order to, to, to contribute to identification to establish the presumed nationality. Secondly, we do fingerprinting. And, and during the initial debate, the executive director Fabrice Legerie explained uh, that, that we have increased the percentage of fingerprinting and the percentage of registration from below 50% now to almost 100% in those areas where the EU agencies, Frontex, Europol, Eurojust, EASO, are supporting the national authorities for doing um, the security work, for, doing, for starting the relocation, referral, and others. Registration, as I said, to, to systematically uh, count and collect the data and to register the migrants. And then, of course, important debriefing to interview a certain number of migrants in order to, f to collect information that is relevant for criminal investigation, to support investigation units of the member states, to support Europol in its role to coordinate on EU level investigation and to, uh, to contribute, to actively contribute to the dismantling of uh, migration, uh, facilitated migration network. An important uh, element uh, to do this with success is to process personal data. For a regular police officer somewhere in the European Union police authority, it's not a it, it's nothing surprising and it's a, a regular uh, element of his daily work to process information containing personal data. But for Frontex it was not until beginning of 2016. Our regulation uh, of 2011 gave us a clear, solid legal basis for this, but we had to develop a work stream, we had to involve the data protection supervisor, but now we are we we make use of it meanwhile in all of our coordinated joint operations so this is <clears throat> this means to to contribute to border security also when being confronted with massive migratory flows and this applies in particular to the hotspots where the eu provides operational solidarity to the national authorities that are under exceptional pressure. And, uh, and, and this means, uh, hotspot means a border section where we have migratory 
flows, massive flows and mixed flows. Labor migrants, um, refugees, vulnerable persons and groups that are in need of protection. And therefore, different national authorities need to take care on the mixture of this migratory flow. And the idea of hotspot approach from the European perspective is that the different EU agencies, as I said, Frontex, EASO, Europol, Eurojust, support each the co competent national authorities on the best way to cope with this mixed migratory flow. This is what European operational solidarity means. And, uh, and in, in, in principle, th this is the, the old story, to use the borders as a filter, a filter for situational awareness, a filter for detection of crime, a filter for detection of irregularities up to terrorism, a filter for starting investigation and providing operational response. And this applies to all types of borders, by the way. It applies also to air borders, where we, where we constantly look for children being victims of trafficking in human beings, so extremely vulnerable persons. It applies to the land borders, where we have to do with a clandestine entry, with a trafficking in human being, with a detection of stolen vehicles on the exit control, with a uh, detection of firearms trafficking and drugs uh, trafficking as well. And, and, and this applies, of course, uh, at the maritime domain in general, where by doing border surveillance, we strive for detecting several types of uh, cross-border crime, drugs trafficking, environmental crime, illegal fishing and fishing and others. So to, to follow the old principle, use the border control as a filter for detection and investigation of crime. Maybe I, I could uh, stop here um, by concluding that Front Frontex as a supporter and as a uh, yeah to, to, to render assistance to the competent member states authorities has the ambition and is committed to follow this way to <clears throat> to uh, enhance its support on border control providing the opportunity of detecting and investigation investigating cross-border crime Thank you, Klaus, for these introductory remarks about the Frontex itself, the key player uh, from the EU perspective, taking into consideration all the security-related um, issues, risks, and threats. And now, as uh, as we um, as we said before, uh, we would like to give the floor to our second speaker. So now the floor is yours, uh, Eger. If you could give us a short overview of what, of, of what you've prepared for us today. Uh, thank you, Marta. <clears throat> At, we can easily say that uh, we can consider the free movement area or the Schengen area or the area uh, without internal border controls, we can easily consider the area as one of the greatest achievements of European Union. And we have to protect it. We have to protect our achievements. But we can also compare Schengen area or, or the free movement area with a stronghold. This means that the stronghold is as as strong as it as gate. So so this means that the, the border guards and the border management is is a crucial actor in in this field. So if you want to uh, maintain inter internal security in the area, it's the one of the biggest parts in this game is also for the for the border management. So this means that if we remove the internal borders, we have to step up somewhere else. So this means on the borders. Taking into account the, account the fact that uh, the, the volumes of traffic, uh, of people's traffic uh, in the borders, it's increasing uh, yearly. This means that if you want to increase the security, or if you want to cope with the, with the, the volumes of traffic, we have certain options. One of the options is to increase significantly the amount of border guards. 
but this is also uh, leads into a significant uh, uh, investments and this cannot be considered as a sustainable uh, approach because we are not allowed to increase the staff numbers uh, until the future. We are not allowed to do it uh, again and again and again. We don't have the resources for that. The other option is just to decrease the, the, the security controls. But as we are in the situation that we are now in Europe and in the world, we don't have this option also on the table. So this means something else has to be changed in, or, in order to cope with the, with the border traffic, uh, with order to cope with the extra needs in, in the security field. And the other option is to just to speed up our processes. A process on the border and processes uh, also inland. Uh, there are several solutions how to speed up uh, those processes. One of the, the solutions can be considered uh, using more pre-processing. So to deal with the people coming on the borders before they actually arrive to the borders. For this, one of the, one of the solutions also uh, taught now and that we are uh, heading towards is the uh, ETIAS system which allows to check a uh, big uh, part of the, of the travelers before they arrive to our borders. This means that we can actually uh, concentrate on the people's movement and the backgrounds of the, of the persons arriving to our borders before they arrive. Uh, and we can detect the ones who actually threat our security. And this is, uh, this is also giving some of the, the additional options uh, in the field, uh, this means that if we can prevent the travel of, of the persons uh, who are actually threatening our security or, or pose a migration risk, then this means that we can also open up uh, on somewhere else. This means that we can have additional arrangements in, uh, in visa liberalization uh, and so on, because now, we don't have the capacity to, to even more uh, foster or, or grow bigger in this manner because we don't have the, the, the power or the man force for that. This is for, for the pre-processing that we have to deal with the, with the volumes before they actually arrive to the borders. Uh, but still there are lots of people coming to the borders. Uh, and in this matter we also have to speed up on the processes over there. And one of the solutions for this is also the, the entry exit system, which is also under development. Uh, hopefully soon uh, to be adopted and, and also uh, uh, put into practice. But we know that as the, uh, the entry exit as it stands now, it provides the possibility to, to gather information about, about border crossings and to share the information about border crossings electronically. But this is Regarding the processes on the border, this is also has the, <coughs> the other significant value. This means that the entry exit system also provides, as it stands now, provides for electronic stamping. This means that we don't have to spend times on stamping the, the passports, and furthermore, we don't have to spend times searching for the stamps in the passports, and we don't have to spend times counting the days whether the person has left uh, to stay in the Schengen area or not. This is also all done by electronically, which means that we can actually uh, save time on those processes and we can actually use this time saved in order to enhance our security, in order to deal with those issues that actually threat is a threat to the, to the, to the security of the European Union. And furthermore, if we are going deeper into the digitalization, then this means that if we have the information available, for example, information about the, the stay of the person, if we have the information about uh, the entries and exits of the person uh, electronically, we can have more use of the ele more electronic means. We can have ABC gates. This means that most of the people uh, exiting EU can actually do it without uh, seeing uh, border guard on, in person. And, and huge parts of, of those persons also arriving to Europe can actually enter without seeing the border guards. 
this doesn't mean that we have to abolish the people. No, this means that we can, those people can actually concentrate where it matters. They can actually concentrate to the persons uh, which are a threat to, the, to the, our security. This is, uh, this is very important to, to speed up the processes, but it's also important uh, that the information quality and quantity is also important. Because having lots of information doesn't usually help us if, the, if it's the wrong information. So we are, we are moving in, in the right direction in this matter. We have the, the entry-exit system, uh, the proposal on the table. We have the proposal for ETIAS. We have proposal for, for SIS in order to amend the, the, the system for, for following the current needs. But uh, I can say from a, my personal experience that information is like a, like a puzzle. If you have the puzzle pieces of the puzzle in different boxes, and you open one box, you're not able to guess what's the whole or overall picture. So this means that in order to see what is the picture, you have to have the, all the puzzles available to you. And I can say uh, this is very, uh, nowadays it's a very uh, popular word, but in some cases in this matter, the magic word can be uh, considered as interoperability. This means that the information systems that we use on the borders, they have to be able to communicate with each other. They have to share information. This means that if the border official, if the, if the person on the front lines goes, goes to the system, he has all the relevant information from this one window, he logs on to one system and sees all the relevant information for him. If, he ha if the person has to spend time just to logging in to this system, to the other system, then to the third, and, and to the fourth uh, system, then he already has forgotten the information that he received from the first one. So this is, this is, uh, this is important, to, to give to the frontline officers the information in a comprehensive manner, so he has all the relevant data, information, that's needed for the, for the border controls. There are some people that are skeptical that, uh, that the interoperability might uh, uh, hamper our data collection and, and data protection, but we are not collecting information only because we want to have lots of information about uh, people. No, this is not the, the cause. The border officials n need to have the information in order to secure and ensure the uh, fundamental rights are delivered in, in Europe. This is not something for, for fun, it's just for, in order to, to safeguard our own uh, citizens. And in order to conclude, I can, uh, I can say that we have positive marks on this field. There are lots of uh, steps taken forward in order to increase the, the security and in order to increase the, the border security. But uh, there are, there are, should we stop here? I think uh, maybe not. There are lots of things other that we can develop. If we take step by step, I think we can ensure border security and we can ensure security in Europe. Thank you. Thanks, Eker, for, for this um, short overview um, how IT, new IT solutions, how new technologies could be useful for for the protection of our uh, our borders and internal and external security. I hope that there will be uh, many questions concerning um, the, some of these tools uh, and the implementation in practice from the audience later. And now um, from this uh, two uh, more general uh, topics uh, given us by Klaus uh, and Eger, I would like to uh, move uh, to two specific cases and we will start with uh, Julie and her um, wide expertise in the field of uh, training. So could you please tell us a bit uh, why training and which kind of training could matter for border guard officials and how it uh, links to the question uh, that we raised today about the internal and external security of the, of the EU? I would be happy to. Um, for everything that we've heard, the challenges that Frontex has to face, and yes, we have IT and information, but ultimately it comes down to people. It comes down to people making decisions about the information. It comes down to people responding to these, being grouped together to go out and to do the job to keep the borders safe, to protect the internal security. Those people 
need very specific knowledge, skills and competences. And they have to be really important ones, the relevant ones, the ones that they actually need. And a lot of situations that are being faced today are new. There are some countries in Europe that have a lot of experience and others that have very little experience. So we, we have a massive challenge to gather that knowledge, those skills, those competences from those who've developed them and to ensure that we share them across the entirety of Europe. This concept of interoperability only happens when people want it to happen. Cooperation only happens when people want it to happen. It doesn't happen by law. It doesn't happen by even a common set of training standards. And Frontex produces excellent ones of those. The CCC, the latest update of the CCC, was uh, just signed in the coffee break in the room down the hall. Um, but they have to be transferred into common values and into a wish and a desire for us to act in an interoperable way and to cooperate well. So one of the, I say the most recent, it's been six years in the development uh, and last week in Salamanca we saw the conferring for the first ever Frontex Joint Masters in Strategic Border Management. And it's a joint degree. It was a, a very painful joint degree to develop. And downstairs uh, this morning I heard a discussion and I was hearing it about in terms of, well, if with Frontex, with the new regulation, can Frontex now dictate to member states? And that might be the, the interpretation that's, that some see. And, and the reaction, the response of, no, this is the European way, that it's not about dictating to member states. Now, we could have developed a joint masters that was a number of different institutions delivered on, and a single university gave, said, here's your, here's your certificate, um, which would have been the easy way, would have been the way that most people do it, but we did the, the true European way. So we worked with up to eight or nine agencies, universities, institutions to actually develop a true joint way. The course contents were delivered by both academics and border guard experts from the entirety of Europe to bring together a shared, unique, European approach to developing the senior managers, the future leaders, the leaders that we actually want to be strategic. Because if we're going to have shared IT systems and if we're going to implement them and they're going to work, we need buy-in from each of the member states to make that happen. So the Joint Masters in Innovation Technology module <laughs> brought together the future leaders of each of the organizations with responsibility for borders to study these things, to realize, to recognize the value, to realize the challenges in each other's countries, not that they don't want to implement it. It's actually, there are very specific challenges. At the end of their uh, year and a half experience and our joint six year experience from inception to final delivery, we produced 23 people who are saying the very things that we need within the leaders to make the response, to make the European response real. We need strategic leaders, we need them to learn together, and just as we need common core curriculum and common standards at the borders of the interaction with the people traveling, we need to develop that joint spirit for the desire for interoperability and cooperation at the tops of the organization, and then we need to move further and develop it in the middles of the organization too, so that we have an entire development that enables the responses to be as best as they possibly can to face the challenges that we have to chase. Thank you, Julie, for this, uh, for this uh, speech. 
uh, as uh, as we've just heard, uh, this is a great added value for Frontex and for European national um, border guard and coast to have this kind uh, this kind of joint master program as the one you you are involved in. And uh, Pascal, our next speaker, just uh, graduated graduated from. So now uh, let's see uh, who are the graduates of of this. Um, uh, highly, uh, highly recognized and prestigious program. So, could you please uh, uh, share with us uh, some thoughts uh, about your observations from the research you carried out concerning the psychological health of uh, border guard um, officers and uh, how it uh, links, why it matters for 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 our topic of today. So, where is the common point for internal and external security? Um, security issues. So the floor is yours. Eight minutes. Thank, thank you, Marta. <laughs> Rob, can you keep the time for me? <laughs> we need time for questions. So. Of course, of course, very important. Julie already said it. It comes down to people. Uh, people like us, our border guard officers um, who do the work in the field. Well, for ages, uh, border guards and police officers have been fulfilling their tasks in their own member states. But for more than 10 years now, the Frontex agency coordinates and deploys border guards to other member states uh, to help the challenged border sections, the hotspots. Um, and border guards don't work in their own environments. They, have, they work in new environments with new peers, new leaders, maybe new operating procedures. Uh, and those changes, um, well, it's not very easy and um, automatically uh, that people can work in those environments. So I will speak about the demands of the current situation in Europe uh, in relation to our deployed colleagues' mental health uh, because uh, terrorism, uh, crime, like cross-border cross crimes and um, the smuggle of human beings, uh, endangers uh, also our border guards um, because in the migration flows, maybe there are foreign fighters uh, within the migrants uh, the smugglers of human beings may be armed and may not hesitate to use it to work, uh, towards our colleagues. Um, well, our border guards are deployed uh, and the, the new environments they work in, uh, they know they have stressful demands for our border guards. Um, and because it's all about the people, we want to keep our border guards healthy. Uh, and I did some research uh, to improve the health and maybe keep the health of our border guards. Well, stress in, in operational work is not unique to border guarding. Um, soldiers from all military branches and, and police officers, uh, they also face stress in their work. Uh, we all know the cases of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, from war veterans, um, from the Vietnam War and the First World War uh, until recent wars with um, counterinsurgency operations. Um, uh, and I researched those, those stressors uh, in the military, um, and one, a few of those stressors are like isolation, uh, powerlessness, <coughs> helplessness, uh, boredom, uh, physical danger, facing the suffering uh, and dead people, uh, and also some organizational and managerial issues during a deployment. Uh, all those factors, um, they, can make, they can create stress in our border guards, and, and stress is very natural. Everybody has stress in this room. I had it this morning when I prepared the speech. Uh, but it's not lethal. <laughs> um, stress is good if you cope with it. Um, and to better cope with it, you need to influence the stress management. And it is very possible because uh, the military and the police, uh, they have a lot of instruments and tools to manage uh, stress. And I'm a commanding officer. Uh, I deploy my border guards in a Frontex operation in Greece now and in the Ukrainian border, um, and when they return, I ask them, how was your deployment? Yeah, it was fine. Okay, go to your shift at the airport, and maybe I'll see you uh, next day. But what did they do? Uh, who's taking care of them while, while they are on deployment? And uh, they need to talk about their, um, their encounters with, with danger. Uh, they need to defuse with their peers and their commanders. They need to be referred to maybe professional health care. But is the culture okay for this? Uh, do border guards really feel safe and secure to talk about their feelings and their emotions and their need for, for help? Do they even know they need help? Well, I, I did some research uh, about that. 
I interviewed a lot of border guards who were deployed to uh, joint operations from Frontex and also uh, the last operations in, in Greece um, on the islands of Chios and, and Lesbos. And while the border, the border guards told me it was all anonymous, uh, an anonymous um, that they faced stressors. Um, they, say they encountered traumatic experiences like the death of migrants, little children. They saw a lot of violence in the reception centers who turned to be detention centers. Um, they also faced, well, they experienced some danger themselves, riots in the camps, uh, possible hostage situations for migrants, stabbings, uh, stabbings and arsoning in, inside of the camps, armed smugglers who used their weapons against our colleagues, uh, and the possible threat of foreign fighters amongst the migrants. Uh, also, ambiguity of the mission is one of the stressors. At first, they started as a reception center on the islands to register and identify the, the migrants, and later on it became detention centers. But they already know these people for months. Uh, they lived with them in the same camps. They already knew their names, their children. They played with them. And all of a sudden, they had to decide uh, who can stay in Europe and who not. Some border guards told me I felt like playing God. Uh, this family can enter the European Union and this family is, has to be sent back to their countries and they all know the horrible story. So it really had an impact on the border guards. They felt powerlessness, uh, powerlessness and helplessness uh, while they have police authorities in their home countries. But now in Greece they did not. They only had, were there for the mission to support the Greek border police. But they saw a lot of violence in those camps. They want to react, but it's not their responsibility. They're there for the identification and the reg registration uh, of the migrants. Of course, it's very logical, but it has to do something with stress. And, um, well, this is not very logical to, um, uh, f for our uh, colleagues. I learned some lessons from the military and the police. Um, like the military, when they go on missions abroad, some of them, like in the United States, United Kingdom, and, and also in the Netherlands, uh, we have embedded, uh, mel um, embedded mental health care uh, givers in the units. So the distance between the operational field and the hospitals is too big. Uh, border guards don't go to the hospital if they feel they have st stress problems, they cannot sleep anymore, they have nightmares. Uh, the distance is too large. So um, some of the armed forces, they bring their psychological caregivers uh, into the units and they send them with them to the operational area. And we tested that in, in Greece uh, with the last border guard missions there for the Dutch border security team. And they were very effective. Everybody wanted to talk to the psychologists and the caregivers. Um, and it reduced the distance between the field and the hospital-based care. Peer practitioners can extend the reach of the prof professional uh, caregivers. Like one in 10 border guards are trained to recognize signs of stress in their peer group. They say, well, um, you're very silent the last day. Uh, what, what's happening to you? And they don't want to talk about it. Well, they refer them to the professional uh, caregivers. Uh, so the peer practitioners extend the reach of the hospital-based or the embedded caregivers. Um, how can those tools and pr uh, programs be used uh, for border guard missions? Well, for starters, uh, when you plan an operation, like in the Frontex headquarters, uh, you should look at the mental health risks uh, in the environment of the, the, the mission area. Uh, and you should make um, a, a tailor-made mitigation program um, to assess all those risks. Uh, you can use influencing factors, like we, I learned from the military and from the police, like leadership, social support from your peers in the unit, uh, and resilience building, like hardiness of our border guards, train them before, uh, use experienced border guards who are very resilient. Um, and you first have to identify the personal care responsibility. Is Frontex, the, uh, the support officer, responsible for personnel care, or is it the sending authority? Is it the border guard himself or his commanding officer back home? Who is responsible for personnel care, and what is personal care? And maybe if we answer those questions, we can set a European stand, uh, standard for personal care um, and imply it for all the missions. Well, I have some uh, to conclude. Uh, border guards, like soldiers and policemen, uh, experience stress during their missions. Uh, they all told me uh, non-coped stress 
uh, may have negative outcomes, not only in their health, uh, it can uh, go to illnesses like heart and vascular diseases, sleeplessness, even some forms of cancer and death um, can occur. Um, it also has some negative outcomes in behavior, like not paying attention to human rights, not working to standards, uh, not good cooperation with peers, and follow regulations. One of the other conclusions is that stress, stress coping, and the strains of stress can be influenced very effectively if you are there in time and on the spot. So I think personnel care is needed for border guard missions. Uh, tools and programs are available and don't have to be invented again. Uh, but only the feasibility of a common European approach uh, needs some further research and um, more European meetings probably like, like this to, to all be convinced that we need it to keep our border guards mentally healthy. Because, concluding with Julie's words, it all comes back to, to people. Thank you. So now I would like to thank you all uh, for this introductory speeches uh, with different time. Uh, in general, it was supposed to be more or less eight minutes, but as it was diversified, so we have still 25 minutes for the discussion. I hope that our audience uh, was uh, inspired and have some uh, interesting reflections, comments, remarks, or questions. So now the floor is yours, and our uh, our experts, our speakers are are at your disposal. Okay, so we have at least two questions, so could you please, uh, each time, yeah. I would like to kindly ask you to briefly introduce yourself. Yes, and I'm, then, uh, uh, I'm Ronald Selstra, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, Marchuse. I have a question. Um, I agree that um, with leaving the internal borders, we need stronger external borders. But what I see now when I'm traveling through Europe is that countries are more focusing on the internal borders. Suddenly everywhere appears uh, checks again because of the fighting of terrorism and all this kind of stuff. Um, how can uh, Frontex convince countries that they have to invest in the external border? So to make the teams uh, at the external border ready to do the checks over there instead of investing in the internal borders. The new regulation gives some powers to Frontex, but uh, what I also see is that at this moment, uh, countries try, try to avoid to point at people for members of the team. They don't want to name men uh, uh, names of persons. They try to avoid to build up the teams. Um, so what can Frontex do to convince the countries that external borders at this moment are really more important than to focus on the internal borders? Because the security is, the threat is coming from outside. If we don't fight them on the outside, yeah, then they are in the inside. And now it's like we are going back to the old situation. Or do we have to get to the next step and create a real European border card? So an independent border card who's standing at the external border, not uh, depending on a country. So not me as a marchese, but me as a border card of a European agency. So we put in one big pool of border cards and we forget about national border carding. I, I think thank you for, for for this question, which is which opens quite a wide scope on on strategy, on on even political on political level. And and thank you also for the for using the word convincing. This indicates that indeed we don't have the power. We don't have executive powers to take over border control, border security. And as it stands now, we, we should not have. We, we, we should have a robust mandate to support member states. And I think, so how to convince? To, to convince first by being effective. It means if, if we look at the volume of our joint operations and our, our achievements in terms of hotspot implementation. I, I, I think this is not entirely a success story, but one could say that some achievements in the registration percentage, in the cooperation with the national authorities, in, in contributing to investigations, in dismantling criminal networks, 
in processing personal data and sharing it, transmitting it uh, to Europol and, and others. I think in the recent uh, two or three years, several achievements have been made that could demonstrate to European member states authorities, but also to the political decision makers and last not least to the citizens, that <clears throat> effectiveness of external border security, of external border uh, control is in the scope and is constant part of our ambition. And maybe some, some su success stories on arrest of suspects of uh, being uh, foreign terrorist fighters, success stories as we had in spring uh, um, intercepting a, a group where communication data were linked with the IS and investigations are ongoing. Success stories like also uh, dismantling and arresting traffickers in firearms, such success stories uh, could help. I, I agree with you that, that uh, we need to maintain the focus on external border control and at the end, we, we should not uh, find it appropriate to return to internal border check. This can be a plan B, this can be a, a, a temporary plan B, and there are also fields of cooperation, in particular on the counter-terrorism, uh, uh, where Europe is, is, uh, is doing a lot, and, and uh, <coughs> the the counter-terrorism center run by Europol has also now is, is, is in a good crossing and in a good um, successful running uh, speed. But uh, there are fields of, of fight against crime, fields of sharing intelligence, fields of uh, focusing on certain types of, of countermeasures that can be done uh, or, or that, that need to, to, to have also bilateral cooperation and need to, to have uh, <clears throat> some, some uh, national specific measures. But to, to, to introduce internal border checks uh, instead of making border guards and coast guards available for Frontex joint operations cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be uh, a way ahead. So, so we, we, we think that maintaining a volume and a good effectiveness of our joint operations um, should demonstrate to the, to the political level um, that it is worth to further invest in external border control and border security. Thank you, Klaus. We have one more question. Thank you. <clears throat> Sufyan Ajadi, Chair of the Consultative Forum and UNHCR representative to Frontex. I, I like the presentation on welfare. It's not only military that have, or police or border guards. Even humanitarian workers are faced with the PTSD, with stress, staff welfare. And one international organization that can give also a good share of experience and has hundreds of years of experience is ICRC, where they have developed mechanism of allowing <coughs> the staff to express themselves after operations, because stress is there. If there are violations of human rights taking place, certainly the stress increase, and it will increase more in Europe, because now we understand that the courts are being activated against border guards. Lately, a Swiss border guard has been condemned for having returned uh, a Syrian woman to Italy when she was seven months and her water were off. But the lack of gender uh, policies within the border guards will generate more stress if there are only men and no women working with them or not trained male. <clears throat> but uh, hearing about security, Coming from the field, and I haven't worked in Europe for maybe five years, and I worked in Latin America, and I heard 
you speaking today about crisis, major crisis. And coming from a UNHCR, for me, it was not a crisis. There was no uh, a major crisis. It was a major lack of preparation crisis, which means not having a civil protection active, prepared, like in Cyprus in 2006, when <coughs> the European civil protection responded to the evacuation of European, Canadian, Australian, and US citizens from Lebanon during the Israeli bombing of Beirut. You should have seen how the EU civil protection response mechanism was there, preparedness, and then the citizens were evacuated to their country of origin. <clears throat> and it was hundreds of thousands because it dealt also with binationals. I think the EU border guards are very strong and have proved to be very strong. How many terrorist attacks have been taking place in the last five years when we compare with the Banda Bader, the Red Army activities in the 70s, when we compare <coughs> with all uh, the activities of insecurity terrorist attacks that were taking place in the 70s in Europe, I think the border guards have always managed to guard the borders perfectly. And many of the people that are committing nowadays bomb attacks are maybe not refugees, maybe not migrants, but they are maybe leaving in the countries. That's what one has to realize in the analysis. They have grown up, born there, lived there, and committed attacks. Is it a failure of integration policies? Do we have an EU migration policy? I'm asking a lot of questions to trigger a thought. Electronics, IT can work, and I agree with Julie when she says if there is no cooperation, it doesn't work. It has to happen. Europe has different culture, different approaches, but I strongly believe that the European, today is the European Day for Border Guards. We have to be positive and optimistic. <coughs> the Border Guards have been doing their job, and I feel that in Europe, we are still safe. We are not in an unsafe environment. There is no invasion. If we put in place the mechanism and we speak and we communicate, and we don't fear to communicate between agencies, those that have experience, I think we can achieve a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have still eight minutes, so I hope that there will be one or two more questions from the audience. If not, I would like to ask now uh, one question to uh, Julie and uh, to uh, Eger. So let's start maybe with Eger. Uh, uh, be brief. Uh, you've discussed different IT tools and they... Uh, um, and the, possi the possible implementation at the EU level while discussing the question of security. So could you please give us uh, the, the example of one of these IT tools that you, uh, you, you find the most useful and could you go a bit more into details? Yeah, but uh, uh, using IT tools and, and using the word interoperability, it's, uh, you have to have all the possible means in a horizontal way. So, as I said, uh, the information is, is like a puzzle. Having only one piece doesn't give you uh, the whole picture. And uh, you, you need to have the, all the information. You need to have in a comprehensive manner. And uh, if you're talking about data protection, that we are collecting a lot of information, we are, there might be infringement of fundamental rights because uh, there are lots of inf uh, personal information collected. And as I, as I already said previously, the, the interoperability is not uh, hampering fundamental rights. But it's, you've it's providing. Just to, just to uh, give you the example, you, you've mentioned uh, at least twice uh, ETIAS, uh, European Travel Information and uh, Authorization System. Uh, do, you do you think that it could be very useful and maybe it could be a substitute for a, a visa mechanism? Yes, uh, uh, ETIAS is a step forward because we have now we have a huge proportions of travelers uh, coming to our borders and we can see them first time when they actually arrive. ETIAS gives the, gives the possibility to actually process the information beforehand and also for the travelers. Uh, sometimes to, from the travelers there are uh, information or, or doubts that whether the ETIAS is just uh, replacing the visa system and making a new visa. but. Uh, but this means that actually ETIAS is also for the travelers. It's providing security on one hand, 
And also, on the second hand, we can say that this is some sort of a cheap uh, travel insurance because uh, before buying the plane tickets and before boarding the, the, the aircraft, you are, you know, the significant chance of you uh, to enter the EU or not, of course. Uh, the final decision is still made by the border official on the border. <coughs> but me, this means that if you have the ATS authorization to board the aircraft to come to a European borders and you, do, you are not allowed to enter the uh, EU, this means that actually you have some, in some sort or in some matter uh, misused the system and provided in bad faith wrong information. If you cooperate with, uh, with the European authorities, then this means that you have the certainty that you are uh, let, uh, let into the, the EU area. So thank you very much, Eger. It was about this uh, technical stuff, IT tools, and now as we uh, know and uh, uh, we, we were convinced in the beginning by Julie, it's not only about the technical side while protecting the borders, it's also about the, this human dimension and about the right preparation of the people that work at uh, external and internal borders. So I'm, I'm uh, much interested, much more interested in this uh, European Joint Master in Strategic Border Management, having two of you here. So could you please give us a short overview about the, the, what is behind it? I mean, uh, as far as I know, there are six universities involved in this uh, master. When it was developed, uh, how it works, which universities are there, and what are the results, and what are the perspectives for the future? Are you, uh, go are you going to develop this cooperation to propose maybe more specific also uh, majors under this master because this could be very, very useful to have a highly qualified and uh, prepared staff to work uh, at the borders. Uh, obviously, given it's in the title, we were looking to build cooperation, we were looking to build strategic thinking. The have questions that are constantly coming up, why didn't we see this coming? What was our preparedness for it? And, and this is a response to that. To, we are in border guard agencies, law enforcement agencies, we are very good firefighters. Um, and this was about complementing that because we need to remain very good firefighters. We also need to be very well strategically um, led and to think very carefully. The second huge part which is about the design that you're talking about, the multiple universities. But on top of the universities were also the border guard uh, schools and academies that supported the universities and the countries who provided experts who were not part of it. Um, was the, the massive attention and the collection of resources behind this. And this was such that it was jointly owned. This was such that we managed to gather the experience and the knowledge from across Europe to be able to deliver it, to give the European perspective. What we produced was 23 graduates. Unfortunately, uh, some of the graduates, uh, for, uh, for operational reasons, weren't able to continue, or some of the students. So we had tw uh, 23 graduates. And when you hear this 23 talking as a team, when you hear this 23, and you can, if you'd like, go to the master's stand and hear um, some of their comments, and better still, go and see the posters of their research dissertations. Because not only did we have Pascal's here, we have a whole range of research dissertations about specific areas of border management, IBM, um, risk and security, debriefing interviews, how can we improve them, how can we make better use of uh, the data that is extracted, this was a tool by which people learn together and develop strategic thinking, but they also contribute back to the knowledge of Frontex to be able to better support responses in the future. So I think the recruitment is already underway for the next iteration. There are some other universities, I think my understanding, um, University of Bologna, um, Germany, some other countries are interested in joining the consortium that delivers it, which will hopefully mean that it will grow and support the management of border guard agencies moving for forward into the future. So. Thanks a lot. And maybe a short question to the graduate of the program. It's about your research. Um, how, uh, how did you 
why did you decide to research this topic? So what was your source of inspiration? It's your, your uh, field of expertise uh, or it was by accident, you were inspired maybe by one of your profs during the program, so why this topic? Yeah, why this topic? It's the first master's uh, in strategic border management, so there was a lot to write about and to research. Um, but this topic was very special for me because uh, as an officer in the Royal Marsh USA, I'm also a soldier uh, because we are part of the armed forces in the Netherlands. Uh, and the armed forces, they have a lot of experience in, in stress management and coping with stress and also the risks of non-coped stress. Um, and I talked with my fellow students uh, in the class during the master's um, uh, modules uh, and most of them um, were not uh, from the military. Uh, there were civil um, institutions, civil authorities. Um, and some of them had experience with, with stress in daily work and they were also deployed and uh, cooperated with police and other uh, agencies. Uh, but a lot of them did not and they did not have experience in stress management and the strains of stress, the negative outcomes, the possibilities of them. Um, so they were very interested to hear in our management system in the Netherlands, how do we cope with it? And that was the moment when I thought, well, we have to exploit this knowledge also for the broader European border guard community because I really think it's important. And um, well, there was a lot of knowledge available because the military and the police, they have a, a long history of academic research and a, a writing, publishing, but the border guard community does not. Uh, so with this start, I hope to, yeah, to, to start the discussion and the debate and to create a, a broader network and research pool. And uh, well, Frontex is already starting uh, to talk about a, a joint PhD to create more academics and, and teachers in the, in the future. Um, and actually next week uh, I'm invited to come back to Warsaw to help develop a, a human resource uh, strategy to mitigate these stress problems. So Frontex is really doing something with the outcomes of our dissertations. Uh, so that uh, I just, I did not only graduate for my, my, my grade, but, uh, for the degree, but also to develop uh, the community and to improve the management of border guarding. And, and uh, I think Frontex is doing a great job to invite us and uh, already today there are three graduates in the panel discussions uh, so it, it, it's already a good start. It, it's very good, I think. Thanks a lot. Uh, Klaus, would you like to add any final thoughts to, to, our, uh, to our speakers, just to be on time? Yes. Um, first, first I, I, I would, I would uh, advertise a, a good convincing tool for the member states to focus on external border security. And and this is the vulnerability assessment. The, it came to my mind uh, when, when thinking about uh, how, to, how to make it better, as you asked. And vulner vulnerability assessment means to combine the assessment of external threats, criminality, migrat uh, migratory pressure or facilitated illegal migration pressure. Migration as such is not a threat. No, but uh, so to combine external threats, terrorism, criminal criminal activities, with the reaction capacity of member states' authorities, and if the reaction capacity is good, then there is no vulnerability. This is the this is in a nutshell the the principle, and and Frontex is promoting. Frontex is in charge for for doing the vulnerability assessment, but with this. And with the with outcome, with the final reports that we make available to the member states' authorities, with the recommendations that the executive director can issue and which have preventive character to enhance preparedness for crisis, with, with, with these tools and with this vulnerability assessment as approach as such, we can, together with the member states, enhance the preparedness for crisis and enhance the security of external borders. So I think this, this I would like to add. And, and, and secondly, I'm, I, I think that the, the, the research that, that 
um, our, our colleague, our uh, Pascal, did. I think this is, this is a necessary complementary element to carrying out border guard and coast guard tasks. Because we, we, we need always to have in mind the people on the ground that do the jobs and, and the complexity, the complexity of our border guard work as a security actor. This complexity has the consequence that the risk of trauma, the risk of real bad situations that you witness when doing your job at the border increases. And therefore it's, it's important to have the focus on, on both the tasks according to the operational plan, the people that implement the tasks, and what is in the mind, and what, what could come to the mind of people that implement the tasks. Thank you, Klaus. So now I would like to uh, thank you all for being here, for your, uh, for your speeches, for your uh, contributions, for the discussion, and still we are happy to have at least two questions from the audience, because it, uh, it happens sometimes that there is no one that would like to ask something, so it means that uh, you were really uh, involved in, in the debate taking place. So now we are uh, after time that was uh, scheduled for our session. Uh, so thank you very much once again, and hopefully see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.